Hi, we are just so excited to be here with you this evening. I am Sean McAllister. I serve as the Associate Director of Education and Community Impact for the International Festival of Arts and Ideas. And I'm here with the phenomenal JHD, who's been working with us as our education consultant. JHD, you want to say a little hey? Hi, I'm excited <laughs> to be here. So we hope that um, you all had a chance to listen to the podcast before. If you hadn't, that's okay. It's still up on our website. But this evening, we'll be having a book talk and, in, and referencing the podcast that was posted on Friday. So this will be an engaging virtual panel discussion featuring UConn AASI activist and resident Jennifer Heckler Diaz discussing AAPI activism in Connecticut and how it relates to our NEA Big Read book, The Best We Could Do. We want to thank our sponsors for making this possible. This program is a part of the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts Big Read that is managed by Arts Midwest. The New Haven Free Public Library is an amazing partner with us on this. We want to give thanks to the David T. Landrock Foundation and the New Alliance Foundation. So I'm going to get out the way and let all the magic begin. Welcome. So as Shaw said, I'm JHD or Jenny Hekula Diaz. I use they and she pronouns and I am an activist in residence at UConn at the Asian and Asian American Studies Institute. Um, I do various roles in education and I'm so excited about tonight's conversation. Um, we have some students here who have been reading the graphic novel that you all have been reading as well as part of the Community Big Read. We have some folks that I've been working with over the past few years on legislative work and also on implementation of the education legislation. Um, and then we also have a teacher who's been involved as well. So we have a lot of things that we want to talk about and ask each other about. Um, so I'd love to start bringing out our guests so that they can also each introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Raina Walters. I am a high school English teacher at Highville Charter School. Hi, my name is <clears throat> Hi, my name is Ron Doyle. I am a student at Highville Charter School. Hi, well, can everybody hear me well before I keep going? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Eris Sky. I'm also a student at Hyper Charter School. So this is going to be a really interesting conversation because the three folks that are on the call with me right now have all just finished reading the book together um, in class. Uh, we have two juniors from Highville Charter School and their teacher, Raina Walters, who, to be honest, I'm always talking to Raina about something. We're always finding something that we can collaborate on or collude on. Um, so this is one of many different things. Um, but I wanted to make sure that we had a chance to talk with students who are actually part of the big read and who are engaging with this amazing graphic memoir. Um, so I have some questions that we've talked about together um, that I want to use as prompts this evening to get the conversation going. Um, I know we also want to talk about Ghost Mountain, and I'm not saying you can't, um, because that is an important documentary that's related to um, tonight's conversation and to the graphic memoir. Um, but let's try to focus on the best we could do um, in our conversation. So first, um, asking Eris and Ron, what are some themes or storylines that really stood out to you, either personally, whether they resonated with you, or they were something that jumped out at you because you'd never read something like that before? Um, well, a theme I really think about is, well, first and foremost, family, because that's what you really needed during those times, especially during those times where you're a refugee, and you're trying to get out of that situation, especially when you're kind of born into that situation. You kind of have to always run the fight or fight because if you don't, then nine times out of ten, kind of going to be stuck. I also, like, you know, I feel family is definitely important. I also feel that sacrifice is a good thing because you have to make sacrifices just to get by. If you want to be in a good living situation, sometimes you can't always just go the easy way out. You have to do different kinds of times to get to that exact point. Um, some themes that stood out to me was uh, definitely like moving 
from you know um one place you know vietnam being exactly specifically you know just like finding that new home away from home especially now in that situation where you're kind of just like moving from like a war front to now a society that you don't know and you know, and kind of like what eris said just like that new experience as well as like have not having like as well as family orienting so like that family bonding and like experience family experience that you know coming from a new place to another ron i'm not sure if you want to talk about this with us um but your teacher did mention to me that you have um your family also has some resonance with this experience in terms of coming to the united states um, yes, well, um, both of my family, well, both of my mom and dad are um, both from um, different um, countries in the Caribbean. Well, well, my mom and dad are both from like the Caribbean and like they both, you know, came here and just that experience alone, just that new home away from home, um, just coming here, it's a new experience for them. And I can kind of like relate and see how that can, that shift is like very um different um and i don't know reina if you want to join in on the conversation right now or you want to wait till the next segment on speaking on some of the themes and storylines that stood out to you um also you and then also maybe to your class some some trends you noticed and and what what they were interested in talking about because there are so many themes in the book yeah, there are. Actually, I woke up with a theme in my mind and Ron is, Ron came through during class. You said it, Ron, and you didn't say it tonight. And that is um, the idea of reflection and how that helps to inform your present. And so through the reflection of her parents, she was able to see, right, and go through this process of, of forgiveness. I thought that was a, a huge, huge theme. And I, in my class, as we kind of like, um, dug through the trauma, that that story of reflection and forgiveness and understanding was something that really rang through. And so another thing was um, the relationship to America, how how um, with through these experiences and, and Ron touched upon it, um, America's involvement in, in people's like that relationship and the feelings and how to resolve that if that, you know, and while you on one hand, this is a land that provides a lot of opportunity. You know, on the other hand, it, there, you also have this relationship of um, of the war and things that had happened. My kids had talked about that. Yeah. So what are some of the new things that you learned? Um, so kind of jumping off what Raina was just talking about, what are some of the new things you learned from reading this graphic memoir um, about history, about the United States, about yourself? Um, some things I learned, well, one of the things that I learned was that, um, Vietnam was colonized by the French at one point. I didn't know that at all. That's something new that I learned, but that's not really widely taught. So, and I'm American, I'm from here, so we never really learned that in schools. And I learned that, um, there's a lot of, like, things that, that mo what most people know when it comes to the war between the U.S. and Vietnam. There's so many things in that book that's disturbing. And even in Ghost Mountains, that's very disturbing that I didn't know. And it kind of just makes me, it gets me, like, like, you get that feeling where it's just like it's not fair, but you can't do anything about it. And, and you kind of just kind of, that's what it is. You kind of just feel that defeat because... You wish you could do something, but at the same time, it's like now that you like read the story, now that you know, it's good to be aware about those things so that you know for a fact if it happens again, it's like you know who did it. They can't lie about it because, you know. Um, one thing that I've learned from this book is like, oh, I just okay. Um, one thing I've learned from this book is just like that that experience like that refugee like reflux that was talked about in the book and like how that that well it kind of just relate to me personally just you know being from my parents just being from like for like from a, a, a country moving here to america just like that refugee reflux as well as like the um, asian american involvement especially in wars because like when we look a lot like, when we look in a lot of history a lot of you know countries such as japan vietnam cambodia have um, all Asian like countries have just 
been a war, especially with like the U.S. and like the U.S. ties of like what Ms. Walter said, just like the U.S. ties of um, them being in the war and just like how that is so important to, you know, us as America and how we don't really talk about those issues in a way. We just kind of, you know, say we kind of just brush upon those issues. We don't really, you know, go into depth of like what is like in this. And I feel like this book is like a good example of like a good like starter of like how these issues are um being taught and just like how these issues are being brought up in a way. How about you, Reina? Anything you wanna add into there? Um, the the thing I really enjoyed about this, I read it a few times. A few times, um, the writing, and I, I I appreciate how vulnerable she is, and so. Um, this book is actually like a springboard for us. It, I have the juniors. So this quarter, we're going to be using this as a springboard for our personal essays. And I just think it's a, it's such a power, like this and Ghost Mountain, because it's, it's a powerful way of like reflecting on your family, your life and being able to project your future and what that will be like after you do some, some resolution. So that's something that I get from this book. I didn't think that I would be teaching the juniors their personal essay based on this book. So I'm kind of surprised, but um, I'm very excited because I think that because of her vulnerability, it'll help them with their personal stories. And, you know, those strong personal stories and strong writing, that's what's going to help them. So I appreciate it. So I'm very surprised that I got that, but I love that. I love it. All right, so I've heard from all three of you in some shape or form that this is a book worth reading. Um, so tell us a little bit more about why you would recommend it to somebody else. If someone asked you for a book recommendation, why would this be a, a graphic memoir that you tell other people to check out? Um, I would recommend this book, well, for one, because I love graphic novels. I've read them a lot since I was, you know, a kid. I still read them now. But I would definitely recommend this book. I like graphic novels that tell stories like this one. Because it's one thing if you read like a regular chapter book with just words. I mean, some people could visualize it. I can. But with the pictures, it's better to see like exactly what's going on so that you have a better idea. So that you know like going forward. Like, what can I do about this? Or how can I make myself more aware about this? Especially with this story, it gives you the side of somebody who went through it in Vietnam, not somebody from America that just seen it from a textbook and learned it in class at the Water Down Bridge. You get it from somebody else. And now that you got it from somebody else that went through that, you can understand what they went through and why it's so harmful to the generations before and how you can help the generation who's coming in as we get older to understand the history and, you know, be aware and, to, you know, try to find things that prevent it. Um, kind of like what Eris said, it's like, this book is like a great example of like, um, just that refugee, like, um, influence and like how that can, you know, affect, affect people, especially when they're coming into like a first world country. And, um, okay. Um, okay. Um, one thing that like, I like about this book is it being a graphic novel and many graphic no that graphic novels that tell a story. And, you know, we have like the Persepolis, which is a great example of like a book that, um, a graphic novel that tells a story. It's like, it's a, it's a, it shows illustration. However, it displays like a very, you know, important um, topic and subject, and especially a part of that. And that's the reason why I would recommend this book to teachers because not only does it show illustrations with a lot of kids you know gravity towards but also it tells a story and a deeper message and i feel like um it's it can like hook a lot of you know kids i want to build on what ron just said it does hook the kids i have a couple of reluctant readers in the class and today one of them like read out loud for us, which is pretty fantastic. That was, so it's because it's a really engaging way to to get inside the text and to tell, it's a traumatic story, right? It's a hard one, but I, I think like Eris said, those visuals help you to understand and you see the faces and, and you get the real idea of what the, the artist wants you to know. So it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. I feel like I'm gonna ask you some more questions, but I wanna also bring on um, our other guests. But before um, Eris and Ron go, 
do either of you have questions? And we talked about this beforehand. Any questions that you might want to ask the professors who are joining us? Um, I do want to ask because I'm not Asian myself. I'm bl- I'm a black person, so my um the way I live life is different. But I do also want to know, like, because I remember I'm not even gonna lie. I don't I know that I haven't known much about Asian history until like maybe sixth, seventh grade, because I didn't know much about what I, when do you think the Asian American, like, when do you think the history of just people who are Asian American in general, when do you think that became so broadly, like, brought up? Because even today, it's people that still don't know about it. So I want to know, what do you think about broadly brought up? Because from what I learned, from what I've seen, it's not really known about until, like, up until recently. So when do you think people realize maybe we should put this more in the media? I don't know, Jason or Quan, if you want to speak to that. And maybe before you start speaking, introduce yourself as well. Jason, I feel like you should take that that point. I'll, <laughs> okay. I'll add on because okay, I, you're sure. a qualified historian here in this room. Oh, gosh. Um, uh, uh, first of all, Ron, Eris, uh, Raina, I am just so enthralled with your learning community there. Uh, this is a wonderful conversation. It's lovely to hear your thoughts on, on this text. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jason Oliver Chang. I am Associate Professor of History and Asian American Studies at the University of Connecticut. Uh, and I also direct the Asian and Asian American Studies Institute, where we do a lot of the curriculum work uh, that um, that JHD has been talking about. And JHD is a leader uh, 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 in this in this space. And uh, absolutely indispensable uh, in doing the work, the very work that Eris that you're asking about. Um, you know, so the state of Connecticut actually has a um, a statute, a new statute, uh, making Asian American Pacific Islander history mandatory um, in K through 12, which is pretty fantastic. Uh, not a lot of states have that. Some have some aspect of it. But Connecticut has one of the most robust uh, you know, education mandates. So the, now that we have this statute, we have to do the hard work of, of bringing that to schools, bringing that to teachers, making resources available and training the, the next generation um, of educators. So, um, so this work, you know, we're trying to work really at the, at the ground level and to begin in kindergarten. I think that's a great place to start. Uh, and pre-K, right? So um, because it's never too it's never too early to learn about yourself, and it's never too early to learn about your neighbors and the people that form your community. So, um, so I think that's a, a, a great place to begin. And you know, children's lives are really complex, and already you know have many of the of the the components of stories that you guys are are reading about whether it's or whether it's uh, uh persepolis or uh, or the the best we could do you know these are um these are you know uh youth experiences you know and so when we provide stories that reflect their actual you know family or lived experience i think they get more invested in their education more invested in the text and more excited about learning and seeing that their lives are worth knowing about. Okay, so I'll, I'll uh, jump in as well. Hello, everyone. My name is Quan Tran, and I am a senior lecturer at Yale University, teaching in a program called Ethnicity, Race, and Migration. Um, my specialization is on Asian American history, as well as critical refugee studies. Um, and thank you for in, including me in this beautiful conversation. Um, I think one of the thing, areas uh, to answer your question and to add on to what Dr. Chang has been uh, men- mentioning, right? I think for us all to live in this country, um, which is a multiracial, multicultural space, um, we, you know, surprisingly have very little understanding um, of what were some of the histories um, that created our contemporary society. And 
because of that, it created a lot of these gaps, right? That, as as Aris mentioned, that you you know you as as a, as a Black American um, don't feel like you have a good understanding of how Asian Americans exist in this country, um, and that kind of gap has to do with our education system, the ways in which we have a primarily privileged um, certain kind of history over others, and so the efforts that Dr. Chang and JHD um, are working on, right, is really trying to correct some of that gaps. Um, and, and in so doing, I wanted to highlight the fact that we're also thinking about history is something that is around us, right? History is part of our local landscape and our local fabric. And what would it mean for us to learn about our history in relationship with each other's history rather than as something that is in a silo? Um, you know, one point that I just wanted to point out is that Asian American as a as a population um, are bestraddled by these these two um, myths, right? The model minority myths and um, the the myth that we are perpetual foreigners, um, and that is because we our histories in this country um, are not taught, right? Um, and are not something that um, could become a space for us to actually also understand our relationship with other communities of color as well um, as the white dominant society. And so these kinds of content are really important for us to understand. And one of the things that I think this book, um, maybe I'm jumping a little bit ahead here, but I think one of the things that this book is doing is that it's actually offering us a kind of methodology uh, for relating um, to each other and to the kinds of histories that we all come from, uh, from various perspectives. But you know, there's something that's magical about the ways in which this book um, is not only offering a story of Vietnamese Americans or Vietnamese refugees, but if you kind of you know take it down to the question of how does the author um, create this story? Right? How does the author bring the sense of um, appreciation to the characters in her book? Right? How how do how does the author create a sense of empathy or compassion um, that allow us to be so invested in the stories of these folks? Um, that is a question of methodology that I think we can learn a lot from um, as we kind of extrapolate from the text itself into the kinds of work that we do in other kinds of spaces, right? Including um, education and community building. So I'll I'll stop there and and entertain other questions or comments. Um, one question that I have is like, do you also have like other recommendations when it comes to like teaching um, Asian American like like culture like cultural standards instead of the curriculum? Like, how is um, ah, just had it, but like, how is um, how do you like go approach you know teaching these like standards to um, kids, especially during like how not during but like how it's set up now, like where a lot of like history that we learn today is um, kind of like predominantly like just the standard history. Like how do we go across to, you know, teach this, you know, other like, um, uh, but like the Asian American culture, that's my, my question. Yeah, I, I love that question, Ron. Um, and uh, as a professor of Asian American studies, I'm just like surrounded by all of the texts that uh, that I would use to teach. So I actually have them like right on hand. And there's like another stack of books right next to me. So like I teach this book, Asian American Histories of the United States by Kathy Choi. She also happens to be my dissertation advisor, which is pretty cool. Um, and uh, she's just a brilliant writer. And the awesome thing about this book is it starts in the present. And then it works backwards through history and each chapter kind of connects to a different sort of origin story of Asian America. And it does so in this really, you know, new ways of sort of combining people's histories the way that Quan is talking about and, you know, not treating it like a silo or like, you know, just like the 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 sole like missing chapter of of, of U.S. history and and everything else is sort of separate. Right. She does a great job of connecting those dots and starting in the present where people are at and then helping them to understand how complex and varied and diverse the Asian American history is. 
The other thing I like to share with folks is this book. It's called Eating Asian America. Have you seen this bottle before? It's a Shiracha bottle. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, all of these stories are about food and Asian American food ways. Uh, and it's just a tremendous story that, you know, a lot of times we're introduced to a culture by their food. And, and sometimes, you know, we may know the food, but we don't know the hands that make it. Right. And so when we start thinking about the history, you know, history through food and through those those experiences, it kind of opens up. Oh, wow. This like Quan and, and GHT are saying like Asian American history is everywhere. And it also shows these really cool ways that things are interrelated and um, and that, you know, we, we see, you know, like, um, uh, for instance, the. Um, um, the the Chinese restaurant on Park over where I live on um, Park Avenue, um, they serve plantains, right? And, and because the uh, their a lot of their clientele are Caribbean, right? Um, but then you can also go and uh, go to you know um, a, a, a Vietnamese restaurant and uh, and they also have like tamales. Uh, because there is a connection to these communities. So food is like this really wonderful way to see and observe, you know, how cultures are, are interacting. So um, it's a really great book. Uh, and there's a volume two is going to be coming out soon as well. So I would recommend those. Those are great recommendation, Jason. Um, fun fact, I provided the Vietnamese translation for part of that cover on the Sri Racha bottle. <laughs> yes, um, that's awesome. So, yeah, so you know, I think the other thing that I, I would also add is that, and, and I think it, this book actually kind of help us recognize also um, the, the potential of learning from other people in our communities, right? Um, because each and every one of us has a history. Um, and, and, and we are, you know, on an everyday kind of basis, we are interacting with people um, who carry with them, right? These deep and rich stories. And so how do we make room to, to make sure that in, we're also learning um, from the people who are already in, uh, in the landscape that we um, habituate in, right? And then to think about, it's usually, you know, how do you foster uh, connections and, and conversation? It is about asking uh, questions and asking it with a sincerity about wanting to learn about someone's culture or someone's history. Um, and so, you know, food is a great way, right? But but not just going in and eating the food and trying something new, um, but actually getting to know the people who create the food, right? Getting to know the history of the one restaurant that you frequent um, are all kind of practical ways in which I think you can make the history lessons and, and those kinds of experiences of learning um, beyond the classroom, right? And that once you are invested in someone's story, once you know someone's name, Name, it's much harder to ignore their complexity, right? Um, it's easier to create a space for you to, to know them and for them to know you, not just as consumers in these spaces, but actually members of communities that we can actually get to know each other. And, um, and in some ways, I feel like uh, that's the one thing with all of these histories that we we tend to oftentimes only see on the surface and make uh, a lot of judgments uh, based on right, a lack of understanding um, and to to battle that and, and, and to close the gap. I think some of those things has to be conversations as well, in addition to the text that we've read or the books and films that we've seen. The great news is that there's so much more content available now. Um, on Asian American histories and experiences that uh, you can, you know, you can enrich yourself in addition to what's being taught in school or not being taught in school. So you have the autonomy um, and, and the tools, right, to go and, and search for those things. Um, but systematically speaking, it is also crucial for our education system um, to acknowledge and in, include um, these important history and how they're related to each other.
All right, I'm sure that Eris and, and Ron can come up with more questions um, to ask. Um, I wanna get back to talking about the book though and give Ron and Eris a break. Um, we'll have you back though, of course, a little bit later to, to close out our time together. Um, I wanted to ask um, Jason, Quan, and Rena to stay. And let's talk about the book talk that Theboy did. Um, I mean, there's so we could spend the whole night just talking about just talking about how she she shared with us her process. Um, I loved it. One of the main reasons why I loved listening to her talk about it was because um, she did it with the care and the the clarity of a teacher. Um, and it, so I really appreciated her taking us through um, through her artistic, creative writing process. Um, but I wanted to hear from you all about your thoughts about about her talk. Um, what was most interesting to you or meaningful to you um, personally or as an educator? Tell us about it. I guess I can go first. Um, so uh, it was just so delightful to hear the artist uh, and the writer speak about um, about telling the story and how challenging it was for for her to to do that. Um, I really enjoyed hearing about her um, her her artistic process because um, there is a kind of economy of words and images that is just so magical in this text. Um, and they support each other. There's not like too many words that just take up the page, but that also the images can be sparse sometimes, but are so effective. And, uh, and so I just really loved hearing her talk about that. And the point that I thought was um, the point that she made which I really identified with was that in telling these stories visually, uh, that being being um, intentional about the details of the story was something that helped to make the story more universal. So by by providing sort of details on like the kinds of clothing people were wearing or what the the room looked like, it gives a kind of personality to. Uh, to the story that I think everyone has their own kind of personal details that would that that evokes a similar kind of memory experience. Uh, so those are um, that was you know one piece of it that I thought was um, that I learned a lot just in terms of thinking about graphic narratives in general. Um, and uh, and then secondly, just about the form or the 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 narrative structure, the way that she discussed uh, representing her parents, I thought was a really, uh, really just powerful demonstration of 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 narrative. And um, and she she talked specifically about um, thinking about her parents as children, and I thought that was such a powerful point because it helps to understand how trauma can be passed down uh, intergenerationally, but it also provided a way to, uh, to create empathy. And like Reina, what you were saying about the sort of forgiveness and the healing and stuff that happens, I think that is one of those mechanisms that enables that process to unfold is you know, thinking about our, our parents as children um, and so I just thought that was a really, you know, something I didn't expect to learn from, from, from her in that, in that text, but it, you know, she explained it so, so beautifully. I, I guess I, I write, I'm not a writer, but I do like to write. And so I, I think that's why I'm just so struck by the vulnerability that she shares throughout in, in sharing um, about our family and the process. For me, that takeaway, it kind of helps to push me as a, as, like her work helps to push me to trust that the students can do that same work. It's not on the same level, but again, like I want them to be the best writers they can be, whatever that means for them. So um, 
I just really draw inspiration from that vulnerability because that's really hard to do and to do it in the creation, the creative process, but then to be generous enough to share it with us, to allow us into that is, um, I was just really struck by that. It's very, takes a lot of strength, a lot of strength. Yeah, there's so much that I appreciate about this text. Um, but in light of what you both are saying, I think one of the things that makes this such an interesting book is that it's, right, it's, a, it's a visual narrative as well as a literary narrative. And so it invites actually multiple kinds of readings. Um, so, you know, I've read this text like a hundred times, uh, a little bit exaggerating, maybe 98. Um, but, you know, it's like every time I turn to it or I return to it, um, I find a different way of entering the book, right? And I think that's part of what's brilliant about it. What if you read the text without reading the the, the written words, right? How might the imagery uh, sustain throughout the text and, and the different kinds of coloring, the different kinds of uh, strokes that she illustrates through the characters, how might that emerge as its own forms of storytelling? So the book itself um, is quite open um, even though it has the story, but I think it remains open for, <clears throat> excuse me, for interpretation um, and and a different kind of revisiting, right? And and through that, um, every time I do go back to it, I think I I glean a different kind of insight um, based on the different methods of reading, and then all of these things are actually complementary to each other, right? Um, so as a practice, I think in the classroom, um, it's really helpful to also help students to, to learn how to be visual readers as well, right? We're such a visual society. Um, and, and I think sometimes because of just the, the sheer volumes of the visual stimuli that we receive, sometimes we don't slow down enough to actually take the time um, to appreciate, you know, the nuances of the visuality that we're engaging with. And so this text does both. I think the, the written words along with the visual allow us to um, really understand, get invested in the story, feel the emotion, feel the, um, you know, the, the affective dimension of this book is tremendous. Um, and one of the, the, the other thing that I really appreciate about this book is its ability um, to create really um, a space for intergenerational conversation and healing um, in a way that um, I think, you know, once you finish reading that, it leaves you similar questions about your own lives, right? Like, what were my parents like? How do I understand my parents um, beyond the label parents, um, right? And 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 for Boy to to brilliantly has a line that says something along the the line of you know to understand her father, she has to understand him as a child. And this is what Jason was talking about. Um, that's something that I think you know, it doesn't matter if you're Vietnamese or Puerto Rican or, you know, um, whatever context you come from, at the core of that question is applicable um, to all of us. And once we kind of go down that path, it begins to open up for us a different way of knowing, right? A different way of relating um, to the people that are surrounding us in the same way that this is an individual story, um, but you could potentially extrapolate that into communities, right? Um, how do I know about communities beyond the kind of labeling that is given to these community? How do I begin to explore their history, right? And to do all of that, one needs to develop deep think, deep listening um, and deep thinking, and that's how you create empathy. So the book is just so rich on these, so, these different levels that I think um, uh, there's so much, the, the lesson learned isn't just about, you know, you put the book down and then you do your assignment and you finish with it. But I think it resonates in other aspects of life if you let it does that for you. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. I really, really appreciated what, what the both of you are saying. Uh, and I wonder if we might turn to looking at some particular passages in um, in the text, just to you know, you know, for for the viewers, just to think about. Okay, you know, these are some important themes. These are reasons why you know um, why this book is so effective and important. Um, do you guys have a couple pages that are like your favorite, or really illustrate, you know, or d demonstrate some of the the things that you're talking about? Yeah, I, I do. 
<laughs> I do. Awesome. I like. <laughs> I like. I, I'm going to say break characters. Not that she break character. She doesn't break character, but there are just spaces where she becomes. She she becomes a little poetic, and I love those. Mm. Like the end, like when she's wrapping up, it's very poetic. Um, and although this is not, it's not um, happy time. This is like my favorite, and this is from page 157. Um, mm. And it says, every casualty in war is someone's grandmother, grandfather, mother, father, brother, sister, child, lover. And even now saying it, it makes me really tear up. And every time I read it, it does, it's just so powerful. It's just the reminder that we're all human beings and war affects us all. It doesn't matter who you are. So that's one of my things. I'm getting teared up now and I'm going to shut up. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah, just like what I was saying, the, the different ways to enter this this text. Um yeah, thank you for sharing that. Quan, what what are you thinking about? Yeah, so along that line, I think um the most powerful scenes in the books are the sort of the beginning and the end, some juxtaposing it. So the first, the the imagery or the moment that stood out to me is actually when she was giving birth, right? Mm. Um, and for me, that is a moment of rupture. Um, that is a moment of trauma. Um, that is a moment of possibilities all, at, all, all in one, right? And mm -hmm. it's, it's that journey that she took from bec in, uh, becoming a mother that kind of really triggered her work um, in really trying to understand where her parents are coming from, right? Like she, she said that, mm. you know, years ago, years before the, the birth of her child, they, they went to Vietnam and when they came back, um, it prompted her to do this deep dive into her family history. But for me, what really consolidated like all of these um, aching for knowing about the past is actually the moment when she became a mother um, because then mm. it's, signifies a kind of uh, transition into a new identity, right? And in that identity, right. she is trying to um, relate to other other people who, who share that identity, meaning her mom, and to really try to understand how her mom became a mom, right? Um, and so mm. part of that is, is her own journey, because I think that rupture of giving birth, the physical rupture and pain and trauma of giving birth, um, is is a continuation sometimes too of the ruptures and traumas that her parents have experienced, right? And so, mm -hmm. fast forward um, until the end of the book, where there's the scene of of her her son, right, and her swimming in the water. Um, for me, that's kind of an arc of the narrative that she is breaking. She's breaking the trauma. She's breaking. Mm -hmm. The, the transports of the traumatic past that her parents weren't able to break and had passed it down to her. And so it makes the book becomes this beautiful and powerful journey of um, you know, creating for herself a new future and a new narrative to go forth. Um, one mm. that is based on these past, these painful past, but she's not solely defined by that. And so by the end of the book, um, the, the, she comes out, right, as her, her there's an autonomous self um, that is aware of the past, but has a choice and an option in mm -hmm. terms of how she wants to take that past forward and whether, you know, what parts of it to pass down to, to the future generation, that, meaning her son. Mm. Yeah, uh, that that's just beautiful. Yeah, we always have a choice, but you know how we approach that history and that reflective space um, is always that's the challenge, and that's the uh, where you know. So my you know just in connection to your point, Jade uh, uh, Quan, I was thinking about uh, the beginning of chapter four, blood and rice, and this the scene where she's um she's sitting or she's standing in um uh in front of her uh her father but they're, they're they're well they're both at her mom's apartment and uh but then they're standing there and then she draws herself as a child and her father as an adult uh and then each pain afterwards gradually brings them both so that they're they're uh they're they're both children 
um, and then you know what you know like, like if they were if they were to to be sharing the table as children themselves and and those were these launching points to to her understanding her father and um and then that memory another swimming memory uh where he's in the pond and he's you know thinking about his, his connection to his community there um and and um and so you know i think just like ron was saying about uh and and eris were saying about war like you know once you know it then you 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 want to do something about it once you know that part of your parents you want to know you want to do something about it. you want to you want to connect with them and um uh, and, and 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 um and so i think you know i'm also drawn as a historian i'm also drawn to the beginning of the book where there's um this really cool graphic history timeline of, of Vietnam's interventions from various other you know countries and uh, you know other you know forms of colonialism and then you know that really helps to put the family story in a much larger geopolitical context to show that they were they were really the lucky ones because this was a really uh, brutal experience, um, and uh, and so I think you know there's just so much you know um, yeah just e echoing what everyone else has said this the the emotional connections the multiple entry points um, and you know the the just the the way that the graphics allow us to to connect with the story I think is just wonderful. I'm so thankful for you all sharing different pieces of the book. Um, and I know we could do this for a long time, um, but I am watching the time and I do wanna bring the students back to wrap things up too. But I just have a few questions, one for each of you. Um, I'll start with Reina um, in the classroom as a teacher. So we've shared some things with you, some resources, some opportunities to learn, um, including this graphic memoir the best we could do, including Ghost Mountain. Um, what else could we be doing to support teachers to ensure that the implementation of the Asian American and Pacific Islander studies, um, the legislation, when it goes into effect, you are prepared um, to do this kind of deep work that we've talked about this evening with your students throughout your courses? That's such an easy question, JHG. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good to hear. No, I mean, um, what I've been given thus far has been really incredible. And it's been like a great launching pad. And I have taken the names of both of those books. Thank you so much, Dr. Chang. I will certainly be getting those. Um, the one thing that I, I think I would need is another book <laughs> for us to read because um, as Eris and Ron pointed out, like now that we know, we want to know more. Uh, and going back to Von saying, because all I think about is words, man. People need to know this history, and we've got to work to to make sure they know it. So I would more books, more suggestions, um, and the and the support has been terrific. It has been terrific. I'm going to ask you that question again later because <laughs> that's something, I mean, that's part of what we need to do for teachers, right? Keep asking the questions about what do you need? What kind of supports do you need? Um, Juan, earlier you had made a really strong connection between the importance of education and community building and as having the privilege of being um, co-chair with you of the Asian Pacific American Coalition of Connecticut. Um, I know that that's what we're going for, right? We're not just going for some lessons in the classroom. Um, we're going for a lot more um, than inclusion. Um, so can you tell us about, specifically, I'd love for you to tell us more about um, some of the legislative work that we're supporting um, this current season. And to get really specific, I'd love for you to share a little bit about the legislative work that we're supporting around the, the family caregiver bill. Thanks, JHD co-conspirator. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think part of thinking about how do we build out community is to begin with, you know, understanding our community members, right? So the AAPI community is enormously diverse. Um, 
in, not in not only in terms of our ethnic backgrounds or our socioeconomic background, but also our generational backgrounds. Um, and we know for a fact that in our community, uh, we have multiple generational families, right? So, um, you know, kids being taken care of by grandparents when their parents are going to work. Um, and these are our are, are formations that are not only uh, specific to API communities, but other uh, communities as well. So one of the things that we su were supporting this legislative session, as you mentioned, um, is the Family Caregiver Act. Um, it's not called the Family Caregiver Act, but that's just uh, our short hand for that. And it's basically hoping to um, pass legislation so that a a grandparents taking care of grandkids or family members taking care of other family members for because of various reason would get compensated um, for the time that they spend taking care of that right? That's something that has been um, a, a reality in our community um, in a way that we are taxpayer and we're not supported um, in the kinds of work and the kinds of family formations that we currently have. And this actually will um, help, you know, because when we're taking care of our family members, um, instead of putting them in institutions, uh, we are participating in, right, creating safer spaces for um our loved ones, or we're filling out gaps um, in which the institutions and these you know, various care, caregiving spaces do not um, have, they have not been paying attention to the needs of our community. So that is uh, not just familial work, it is social work um, and it is labor, right? That needed to be recognized for that. Um, and as we're doing this and making sure that intergenerational family formations have the support that they need, we're also creating spaces where um, young people can learn from, from older people, right? Um, in that way, there is an organic form of thinking about community and how um, together we're, we're, as a social unit, we're not leaving um, other folks out in the dry. So this is something that when we think about community um, and activism in AAPI spaces, um, that isn't just something about, you know, education is a means um, to build bigger and stronger community. Um, and, and to do that, we actually need everyone to pitch in. So with the education efforts that we're doing, right, we're, you know, I know that at JHD and Jason, you've been encouraging um, teachers across the state to do things like oral histories, right, um, where young people can interview older folks and learn from their life stories. That's the kind of organic connections that we have to continue to foster. Um, and to do that with, you know, support and, and other forms of um, recognitions will be very important for our communities going forward. So that I have a question for Jason too. Um, and this this is hard, Jason, because you're, I don't even know all the projects you're working on all the time. Um, but if you can tell us about one education connected project um, that you're really excited about and that you're seeing some long-term efforts already because the statute doesn't go into effect till 2025, 2026 school year, right? But we've all been hard at work um, even before the legislation got passed. But what's one project that you've been a part of developing, supporting, creating that you're already seeing some long-term traction and it's really getting at like the dreaming that you're doing? Oh, that's, that's such a great question, JHD. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think the project that is that I'm most excited about is the is UConn's uh, early college experience program. It's called ECE for short, and it allows us to to um, to certify high school teachers to teach UConn classes in the high school for dual credit. And we have an intro to Asian American studies class that's an ECE class. So we're certifying a new cohort of teachers this spring, and they'll be teaching this new course uh, in their high schools. And, um, and that is just you know, so exciting for me 
uh, one because teachers are getting new new train and they are so they're like the best people to learn with because they come with such awesome classroom experiences and uh, and and connection to their own school community and um, and that's I think what will actually make this legislation you know more powerful is when we tailor these kinds of things to our communities. And so one of the things that's really important to know about the Asian American community in Connecticut is that it's predominantly South Asian. Those that, that's the largest country of origin is from South Asia. So we have uh, folks from India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, um, and, and, and Sri Lanka and other places in, in South Asia. So, you know, East Asians, which is the typical kind of um, identity that people associate with Asian America, like Chinese American, Japanese, or Korean Americans, right? Um, so when we look at our communities, they're actually really, they don't look like the typical Asian American community, like that was maybe in California 40 years ago, right? Um, so, so when we think about building is sort of homegrown Asian American studies here, uh, you know, it means attending to these, to our communities and making sure that they are present in the curriculum too. They are present in Asian American studies classes. So, um, so, so doing that means that we have to alter the kinds of conversations we have, right? So there is a, a significant portion of Asian Americans in Connecticut who are Muslim. Right. And so also today is Eid. So Eid Mubarak to all the, the celebrate. Uh, and, and these are ways that that we can continue to show how diverse and um, and 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 complex Asian America is, um, but in ways that connect with people's lived experiences and their the communities that they're surrounded by. So um, so the effect of having this program means one high schools can fulfill the, um, the 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 education mandate to include this curriculum right? that's a that 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 fulfills that requirement but then also now students will be leaving high school with asian american states credits in hand that means when they come to yukon they are already one fifth of the way to getting a minor in asian american studies right and and that's a really important time for students to be thinking about that because when rather than it being something that's added on at the end of a degree program say they take a couple courses juniors and seniors right the the goal here is actually to have people study asian american states while they're becoming a nurse while they're becoming a future teacher while they're in business school uh, and and it's those kinds of of learning experiences that we want them to grow into and bring Asian American studies with them. So all of these frameworks of thinking about intergenerational trauma to uh, to the effect of war on on displacement and um, and 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 imperialism, right? The, these are these are really important conversations that need to happen in every occupation because Asian Americans and are, are everywhere and the these issues don't just affect Asian Americans right but by do by bringing this through the educational experience these students are gaining so much more so I'm really excited about this one how we can expand and grow Asian American studies and also the effect that this is going to have on these new students Thank you all so much. I think it's time to bring the students back. And uh, I think it's time for everyone to put in a final word. Um, it could be something you heard somebody say tonight that's really still sitting with you. It could be something that you said tonight that you want to get on your soapbox about and say it again and underscore it. Um, it could be a question that you're thinking about, but leave us with a takeaway that you are bringing with you after this conversation um, so that people in the audience can hear what's on your mind. Um, a takeaway, the one takeaway I have to say is like, just that um, Jason, that um, Mr. Chang, I would say, sorry, um, just that level of like work that you're um, doing for like, you know, K 
kids for like coming students to have um you know and just that oh i'm sorry but them able to having that degree and you know able to like be able to like as they're going into like you know getting their major and just like that getting their minor and like you know learning about this asian american like you know studies and culture is like very inspirational and like that's um something that is you know that program and like you know high school like um teachers are able to like you know teach i feel like that's very like you know cool and uh i like um very inspired Before I go, um, I really like the professors, Mr. Chang and Ms. Chen. I really appreciate having you guys here, especially because you guys know more than I do when it comes to Asian American studies. But also, I'm glad that I was able to talk to you guys because I got a more of an understanding when it comes to studies. And I'm glad that you guys are professors, too, because I guess it just makes more sense because you guys know a lot more. So I was able to learn a lot. And I thank everybody for this opportunity, even though I'm not home. Whether I was home or not, I would love to have been on here. I learned a lot. And I'm going to cherish this information because I never know if I'm going to need it in the future. I'm going to cherish it, period, because, you know, it's a lot of Asians, especially in this country. And, you know, not everybody treats them the way they're supposed to be treated. So with this information, I can just treat them with the most utmost uh, respect, whether it's the bare minimum or not. Um, thank you for the work that you guys are doing. I mean, it definitely has had an effect on my class. They're, they're already a group of very special human beings, but um, the experience that we had together was, um, it was very inspiring. And I think that we we learned how we are even all connected to each other through this, through this story. So um, I appreciate the work and I, I look forward to, to learning more. I, I really do. And one thing I did think another a resource that would be helpful as we talk about like the academics and to go along with what you said, Dr. Chang, m more information about like being able to to provide cultural immersion, you know, so poetry, um, artwork, um, food and things like that, because those are really small but powerful ways to, to share. Yeah, so it's been an honor to be on this panel. Um, thank you, Ron, Iris, and Reina, and Jason uh, for sharing your thoughts and JHD for moderating this. I think for me, um, leaving this conversation, I think I'm gonna lift the title of the book that we're discussing as a way to kind of wrap up some of the things I'm thinking about. Um, a lot of the work that we're doing is, you know, uh, they're kind of forever work um, and work that will keep evolving um, over time and work that we are, uh, going to revise as we keep moving and as our community keep on expanding or contracting depending on what period of time we're in. Um, and so as we're doing it, you know, I think the, the name of the book, uh, the title of the book is apt, right? We will strive to do the best that we could do um, and we can do it um, together. And I think that's what makes uh, it so meaningful. And um, I hope that this conversation will continue to resonate um, in all the spaces that we bring ourselves into. Um, I'm just filled with gratitude to uh, to be in this in this space with y'all. JHD, thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, I mean, I um, I'm thinking about right now. I mean the comments that Eris and, and Ron made about uh, about learning about war. And I mean, it, it's so important because we are surrounded by war, uh, war making, war talk, um, cold wars, hot wars, trade wars, culture wars. Um, we are surrounded by this, and but we rarely talk about it in, in, you know, uh, in, in this kind of detailed way, in this kind of personal way. Uh, and, um, and I think, you know, this is such a great example because you can't know about Asian America without, about, without understanding, you know, where these, uh, where, where the wars, uh, happened. And, um, even though that, you know, we're not, you know, as, as there's the, the saying, we are not a war, um, that, you know, that that's an important lens by which to understand the world um and ourselves 
and uh and so i'm just you know i yeah, ryan you see you you're inspired i'm inspired by you and you know reading you know and and in this classroom uh reading these books uh, uh and asking such fabulous questions and i think that's part of the uh, for me the takeaway that we keep on asking really tough questions uh of ourselves and of our communities um and 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 then when we we do that we answer it together uh and i think you know that's what um I, i'm just you know kind of feeling that that out of out of this this conversation so just thank you everyone i'm going to slide in a quick takeaway too first so many thanks to all of you for being here this evening and being willing to share about the text about your personal experiences um, all the knowledge, the funds of knowledge that each of you have gained from so many different places, including school, but also outside of school as well. Um, the reason why I love these types of conversations is, I mean, this is how we have to do the type of work that we say that we're about, right? If we're really about uh, education and community building, it has to be done, especially with young people and their input and their perspectives on things. So. I'm particularly grateful to Eris and Ron for being a part of this, but of course to, to Reina and Quan and Jason as well. Um, but this is partially part of why I love being a part of the API Curriculum Lab at UConn and part of the Asian Pacific American Coalition of Connecticut. Um, we're all about intergenerational work because we know that that's really the only way that we're gonna get the work done and, and get it right. Um, so thank you all so much. And thank you to everybody in the audience um, for being a part of our conversation this evening. And a big thanks to Shaw, of course, at the International Festival of Arts and Ideas. Yep, there we go. Um, I know Shaw wants to say a few words too. Thanks again to everybody. I just really wanna give an amazing thanks to our amazing panel this evening. Very, so much insightful work. If you haven't learned anything, I encourage you to double back, watch it again. Please share it with your friends. If you have not gotten a copy of this year's Big Read book, the best we could do, it is available at every New Haven Free Public Library branch. If you are a friend in North Haven, the North Haven Memorial Library has some copies as well. If you see me outside, stop me. I might have a copy in my car for you. But we wanna give a big thanks to everybody on the panel, those of you watching. And if you're wondering what's next for us, as far as the Big Read, our next event, we will be supporting the, um, the Yale Jackson School of Global Affairs and their Building Peace Across Generations Conference. Uh, we've been really excited to help curate a panel happening on April 23rd about building peace with the New Haven. This Saturday, if you are free, we are having our um, Reimagining Long Wharf event, uh, which will be an all day immersive event diving into some of the great history about Long Wharf. So please feel free to check our website at rideas.org to get involved.